We're going to get started in just one more minute. We're waiting for people to join us. Thank you. So I think we're ready to get started, Chelsea. Perfect. Um, good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Chelsea Townsend and I am the director of the South Carolina Prescription Monitoring Program and I chair the NASCA Education Committee. Um, I'll be hosting this afternoon's webinar along with NASCA's Kathy Keough. Um, hopefully you guys read through the scrolling material while waiting for the webinar to start, which provides information regarding our sponsors, a NASCA disclaimer, housekeeping items, and announcements. Um, we have a couple things to note. Um, I mentioned this last webinar, but our travel scholarships are now available um, for the conference. Um, we're hoping to have the preliminary conference program available by the end of May. Um, and also one more reminder that uh, we did release a free um, PMP on data integrity um, or free CE on PMP data integrity. Um, and that is still available for pharmacists and pharmacy technicians. So if you have an audience of pharmacy and pharmacy technicians and you want more information on that to distribute to them, please reach out to us. Today's webinar and all of our webinars throughout the year would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. So thank you to our sponsors. Um, and thank you guys for taking the time out of your day to join us for today's webinar on who is really in control when disposing of controlled substances. Um, I know that we will all learn a lot from today's webinar. We are thrilled to have an extremely qualified expert, Kathleen Skabensky. So please allow me to introduce her. Um, Kathleen is the Manager of Regulatory Compliance with Farm Ecology Services Waste Management. She completed a master's degree in residency program for Advanced Hospital Pharmacy Administration at the University of Wisconsin Pharmacy School. She has extensive management and leadership experience in delivering hospital pharmacy services focused in her trained area. In her current role, Kathy is responsible for leading and managing all aspects of pharmaceutical hazardous drug and hazardous waste regulatory changes as it relates to farm ecology products and services, including the Farm E state specific database to ensure compliance, accuracy, and efficiency of the information, interfacing with the regulatory community and matters regarding pharmaceutical waste providing continuing education opportunities and serving as a policy liaison with multiple federal and state regulatory agencies. Um, I'm glad we're all here today to join Kathleen as she shares her extensive knowledge on this topic. Um, so welcome Kathleen and the floor is yours. Great. Well, good afternoon everybody. And thank you Chelsea for that nice introduction. And thanks again to all of you for taking time out of your busy calendars to be here today to uh, go through this webinar. So let me start by sharing my screen, I'm getting this set up here. And again. All right, this just worked a minute ago. <laughs> Let's try this one more time. Screen. And you have the PowerPoint now open. Now you can see it. Now, can you see it? Not yet. Nope. Okay, so what is this? So the PowerPoint is open. And then you hit share screen. I did share screen. Try it again. Yes. Is it there? I don't see it, but do you want me to? Not ideal, but I. Okay, one more time. Let's see. Let me go into 
screen. Now can you see it? No, no not yet. Do you no, have multiple you know monitors? Uh, no, not at, no. Not at okay. this point. Let's see. Let me try going into this one. If that doesn't work, I have what you emailed to me. Can you see this one? Nope. All right. <laughs> they both Kathy and Chelsea can <laughs> attest that we just saw this. Okay. But well, you know what? Let's see. Here, one more time. I, how about if I just share a screen and, and you can just say next, next? I, you know, so that work. Okay? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, I can, Kathy. Okay. Can you see it, Kathleen? I think so. <laughs> I see the presentation up. Right. So I'll have to advance it, I think. Just. Okay. All right. Well, let's go to the next slide. Okay. There we go. Okay. Well, I apologize for this uh, little delay, but let's get started. Um, so this webinar is solely for educational purposes and provides only a general description of various regulatory requirements. Nothing in this presentation will constitute legal advice. And I also want to disclose that I do not have any financial conflicts of interest uh, in terms of this webinar. Next slide, please. The learning objectives for today include three. Our first is to identify the responsibilities and challenges of each person when disposing of controlled substances. And by person, we'll be exploring uh, what it means to be the ultimate user, the non-registrant others, as well as registrants and their um, responsibilities and challenges. The uh, term ultimate user is defined as someone lawfully obtaining and possession a controlled substance for their own use, a member of their family or a dog or an animal in their household. Our second objective will be to understand how subpart P provides regulatory relief for states adopting this regulation when disposing of hazardous controlled substances. And this is where we have um, the challenges brought together because of DEA and EPA regulations in terms of the controlled substances. And lastly, we'll discuss the gaps created by our current regulations and some of the questions posed in DEA's advance notice of proposed rulemaking. The deadline has just passed, um, but we'll um, briefly review some of the information that's in there. Next slide, please. So for all of us to be of understanding where we've come from and where we are today, Let's take a, a step at uh, square one. <laughs> and in the 1970s, the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act was put into place. It was commonly referred to as the Controlled Substance Act. And this was under the direction of President Nixon as, his, as the administration's attempt to get started fighting the war on drugs. Its goal was to give our nation a legal foundation in our federal fight against drug abuse. It was enacted in 1970 and the DEA was given the enforcement rights. This act actually had two different titles. The first one established drug rehabilitation program for those who were um, uh, who were abusing illicit drugs, um, dependent on drugs, who were victims of our um, drug abuse society as it was. The second title actually had two objectives. 
One of those was to restrict access to controlled substances only to those that were registered with the DEA to manufacture, distribute, prescribe, or dispense such products. So you can see there was positioning, there was, there was um, definition around this. There was also this requirement that all regulated substances needed to be placed into one of five schedules. So as you can see from um, the onset, this act was um, very global. Um, not a lot of in, um, details were looking at operations and specific uh, methods, if you will. So let's go to the next slide, please. When we think about the controlled substance schedules, of which there are five, the schedules differ in the um, how drugs are used or their indication, and then also the level of abuse and dependence potential. Schedule one are drugs that have no recognized medical use. Um, you may see them being used in laboratories, um, but as of right now, according to the DEA scheduling definitions, um, they do not have a recognized medical use. Substances that you may recognize would be things like heroin, LSD, and marijuana. And even though states are grappling with uh, use of marijuana for medical purposes, as well as recreational use, according to the DEA, this is still a Schedule I controlled substance. Schedule II uh, controlled substances do have a medical use, but they have a high abuse potential. And substances that you may recognize uh, include cocaine and or oxycodone. Schedule three are substances that have a moderate to low potential for physical and psychological dependence. Again, substances you may recognize would be things like Tylenol with codeine, anabolic steroids, and or testosterone. Schedule four has low potential for abuse and actual and also a low risk of dependence. And products under this category um, you would probably recognize as the benzodiazepines. So the Valiums, the Lorazepam, and some sleep aids like Zolpidem. And then Schedule 5, um, these drugs have lower potential for abuse than Schedule 4, and they also consist of preparations containing limited quantities of certain narcotics. So they're combination products. And again, substances you may recognize would be things like Robitussin AC, which um, contains guaifenesin as well as codeine, and um, Lamotil, which is a product containing diphenoxylate as the narcotic along with uh, atropine. So just wanted to share those schedules with you and to give you some uh, examples of those. Next slide, please. So as you can see, um, the schedules were defined, there were authorizations uh, defined and, and roles of who really was in control of controlled substances and then the rehabilitation um, facilities that were also authorized to be uh, put into place. So a question that we have is, was the Controlled Substance Act successful? Well. In uh, 2010, Congress was looking at data uh, to evaluate that question and really realized that drug abuse continued to grow. Deaths and overdoses were increasing. Rehabilitation admissions were increasing, which was good. So from that perspective, um, the Controlled Substance Act was helpful because at least those facilities and services were being used. But at the same time, violent crime, property crimes were increasing, and teens were impacted significantly. So overall, the answer really is no, it wasn't successful. The state of affairs um, at that time 
was that indeed several states were putting take back programs in place to collect drugs. And this was very helpful in getting um, drugs out of the reach of people that um, fell victim to them. Um, we were trying to get the drugs away so that the accessibility was decreased. But unfortunately, the regulations did not allow for a way of those drugs to be disposed. The most clear path for um, the disposal process was that the states and law enforcement that were conducting these events actually needed to get permission from DEA um, um, assistance. So not necessarily a very straightforward, um, uncomplicated process. Individuals all this time, so individuals, uh, patients at home, um, uh, non-healthcare facilities were recommended um, or advised or at least offered as options the flushing of controlled substances or discarding controlled substances in the trash. They could also surrender any um, substances that they had to law enforcement or again, seek assistance from the DEA. And as you can imagine, as a public mem member trying to figure out what to do with your controlled substances, contacting and understanding the workings of DEA may not have been your first choice. Also with this comes the um, concern about drugs that are getting into our landfills as well as our wastewaters. And then of course, long-term care facilities have unique challenges because they are a healthcare facility, but their patients, if you will, are really residents. And so having a healthcare facility, but having residents, i.e. ultimate users, creates uh, a management um, challenge for the uh, control of those controlled substances. Next slide, please. So in 2010, there was the um, Secure and Responsible Drug Disposal Act that actually allowed the promulgation of the DEA disposal regulation CFR 1300 to 1317. This was published in September of 2014 and took effect one month later. There are three specific subparts of this um, regulation, and it addressed the responsibilities of registrants, as well as ultimate users and the non-registrants, and then specifically looked at um, the details of destruction. So it did provide for us um, requirements upon which we could act, and it also provided options for ultimate users. So options of take back events were expanded. It became nationwide, not just state run, but um, nationwide events. And then there were other uh, programs like mailback programs and other collection receptacles and their locations that came to be. So this was starting to close the gap of how to control these drugs. Next slide, please. So this regulation, it was very important when um, the act was written that Congress needed to make sure that this was a voluntary participation by those that were authorized to participate. It did not, um, it should not have been a requirement. So as you can see, um, this regulation authorized manufacturers distributors, reverse distributors, narcotic treatment programs, retail pharmacies, and hospital and clinics with on-site pharmacies to participate in all of these options. Um, pharmacies also um, 
needed to be authorized to maintain the collection receptacles at long-term care facilities because of their unique challenges. And it also reorganized and consolidated regulations on disposal, but it actually also defined the role of reverse distributors. Next slide, please. Okay, so again, this is listing um, regi excuse me, re registrant disposal and who is all defined under that, the non-registrant disposal, so the ultimate users, and then those other ultimate users at long-term care facilities. Next slide, please. So this is a um, graphic display of the options now that are offered under the regulation to the ultimate user. And you can see here that there are three different bubbles at the top. So moving from left to right, let's start with the collection events. These are actually collection events that are um, nationally offered and recognized. They are managed and um, facilitated by law enforcement. And the result of those collections need to go to reverse distributors that will also ultimately result that um, disposal at incineration. Now, it's interesting and it's important to realize that reverse distributors here are not just reverse distributors for any pharmaceuticals, but these reverse distributors have to be registered with the DEA to receive the controlled substances. And that is true throughout when we talk um, today or this afternoon about the reverse distributors in this presentation. The second bubble is uh, receptacles or the kiosks as they are commonly referred to. And these kiosks, again, are available uh, through collectors and the collectors are listed there and we will um, go into those a little bit more in detail. But kiosks are also available through law enforcement. Note though that again, the collections at these locations into these kiosks have to again result down to the reverse distributors who then need to um, ensure that the destruction is through incineration. And our third bubble on this um, slide at the right is showing the development of mailback programs, which is the specific transaction between the ultimate user and the reverse distributor. So mailback packages are uh, provided to the ultimate user and then they are sent to the reverse distributors that indeed have incinerators um, on site to be able to take care of them. Next slide, please. So I share with you um, this notice from the DEA website of our upcoming National Drug Take Back Day, which is Saturday, April 27th. Um, it is available on their site as well as on many community um, health services sites. Next slide, please. If you are unable to participate in that event though, um, and know that there are two events, one in spring as well as one in fall, there are also ways year round to be able to dispose of controlled substances. And again, this is by the ultimate user. As you can see, there's over 17,000 locations nationwide. These are housed in pharmacies, hospitals, businesses, um, police uh, departments, um, a, a whole host of uh, locations throughout our communities. And actually on this website um, is the button where anybody can go to find a location uh, of drop-off in their community. Next slide, please. Okay, so now let's take a look at, um, we've kind of talked about the, the take back events and who can use those, 
and who was responsible for those. So the reverse distributors, law enforcement, the incinerators. Um, we've talked about the mailbag program. And now let's talk a little bit more about these collection receptacles that are at uh, registrants that are authorized. So they have a modified registration in order to provide this voluntary service. As you can see there, and we're actually gonna be taking, uh, we're gonna be concerning ourselves with the right-hand side of the diagram. So the registrants are listed there. And again, it um, contains everyone from manufacturers, distributors through long-term care facilities. Next slide, please. In addition to identifying who is authorized to participate, there is also requirements for the physical um, collection receptacle itself. And this is part of the regulations and I've included um, the reg references there for you. So these receptacles obviously need to be fastened. They need to be fastened to a permanent structure so that they can't be removed. Um, they need to be locked and it needs to be a substantial container. There are several that are um, on the market for purchase. Um, the outermost part of the receptacle is permanent. The inner collection device um, actually uses liners and we'll get into the requirements surrounding those as well. Um, as you can imagine, kind of like a, um, uh, post office box, there needs to be a small opening, uh, opening to receive the drugs that are being uh, disposed of, but small enough so that one cannot get into the device to retrieve anything else. The container needs to state specifically on the outside that this is for controlled substances in schedules two through five meaning that illicit drugs are not allowed to be disposed of in there. The collectors, and again, the collectors can be the pharmacies, the narcotic treatment programs, you know, the list on the, the slide before, they can also decide to accept non-controlled substances. And we see this a lot, right, with the prescription drug take back days. It is allowing this commingling of, um, uh, medications, but the intent of these receptacles were mainly for controlled substances and um, the collector will let you know if it is acceptable to put in non-controlled substances as well. And again, um, the opening needs to be locked or made inaccessible when staff are not available. Next slide, please. Okay, the inner liner requirements. Um, because you're going to be receiving or you could be receiving all kinds of medications and containers, the liner needs to be waterproof, tamper evident, um, tear resistant. You know, there may be some sharp objects or some glass that are going to be deposited that may shatter. And, so that inner liner needs to be resilient enough to uh, withstand that. What's really important here is that once that liner needs to be removed um, because it's reached its capacity, it immediately needs to be sealed and there can be no touching of the contents and it, the, it can't be opened, it can't be x-rayed, it can't be inventoried, it is considered a done deal. Um, it's also important not to have contents that are viewable from the outside. Again, we don't want to, we want to provide a service. We don't want to create interest from those um, that could find some, um, some danger in these, in these drugs. There are specific sizes, and there's also unique, there needs to be unique identifying numbers for all of the bags because there will be record keeping um, that needs to go along with this whole process. Again, access needs to be restricted to the employees only of the collector. 
and once that liner is being removed, it needs to be sealed by uh, two employees. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, okay, we talked about the schedules and who could use it. What's important is that, again, only the ultimate user and the authorized non-registrants can use these um, receptacles. They cannot be used by um, other pharmacies, and we'll get into that a little bit more. As far as placement of these containers, depending on which type of facility is authorized to collect these, there are um, requirements to make sure that it is supervised and secure. So for example, retail pharmacies, they have to be um, in immediate proximity of the pharmacy inventory so that there is always someone present and supervising it. Hospitals and or clinics, really important not to put it in emergency or urgent care areas. And not only important, but it's required under the regulations because these areas can be very chaotic at times. And so the supervision of those devices um, is uh, required to be elsewhere. In narcotic treatment programs, in those facilities, they need to be securely locked in rooms with no other controlled substances. And in long-term care facilities, again, um, it needs to be secured and regularly monitored by employees. Next slide, please. Okay, so here uh, we have some uh, specifics for long-term care pharmacies. So again, remember my comment about these are healthcare facilities that are providing care, but it's not their patients, they're actually residents who are um, being housed and receiving care in these facilities. So oftentimes medication orders change for um, individuals. And so there is a requirement that within three days of discontinuing the use of controlled substances, either by the physician permanently discontinuing those orders or changing those orders, um, the resident being transferred maybe from long-term care to acute care facility, or even the passing of the resident. Within those three days then, it is allowable for um, a member of the long-term care facility to dispose of those controlled substances on the behalf of that resident into um, the collection receptacle. Again, there needs to be a pharmacy that is installing, managing, and uh, managing that and maintaining that receptacle. There is requirements under the installation and removal transfer storage of the liners. And again, it because it needs to be witnessed to pharmacy employees or a long-term care employee and uh, a pharmacy employee. Liners need to be secured. Um, liners can also be shipped to a reverse distributor or they could be picked up as well. There are records that need to be maintained and I'll show you those. And then this is again, calling attention to pharmacy personnel, the ones that are managing these for the long-term care pharmacy cannot return those filled inner liners back to their pharmacy. It needs to go directly to the reverse um, distributor. Next slide, please. Okay, so what does the reverse distributor, um, what are their requirements? So they can indeed pick up the controlled substances from the registrant or the collection site, or it could be delivered to them by common or contract carrier, or it could be delivered by a non-practitioner registrant. They have uh, several means for them to obtain these, uh, these deposits, if you will. 
they personally need to receive them. And there will be tracking and um, sign-offs on these transactions. And it immediately needs to be stored in a secured area. And the destruction needs to be timely. So within uh, 30, 30 calendar days, if you will. And then of course, the record of destruction will be documented on DEA form 41. So they have specific roles. So as you can see, who is authorized to manage, who is authorized to um, dispose of, and then all of the physical requirements are also defined under these regulations. Next slide, please. This actually lists out all of the records that need to be maintained for the collectors. But the next slide, if you could advance to that, actually shows you in a table format um, all of the data that is required to be recorded. So date, unique ID numbers of those bags, um, the sizes, address of registrant requirements, um, or registration number, excuse me, of collectors, name signature of the employees, address of the reverse distributor, and then registration number of the reverse distributor. And as you can see, uh, they all these pieces of information are required at different times, depending on the stage of that collection process. So from the actual acquisition of the um, uh, device, the liners, and starting with drugs all the way through removal, transfer, and then uh, destruction. Next slide, please. Okay, so we went through um, this, this uh, regulation and we looked at the requirements for not only um, the ultimate users and what they can and can't do and the options available to them, and then for the registrants, uh, what their role was in um, some of the details of their requirements. But in this, in this um, subpart C is the methods of destruction. And this is under the section entitled Destruction of Controlled Substances. Now what's interesting here is that um, this is where it becomes challenging. Um, so our first point here says that the, um, the controlled substances shall be destroyed in compliance with applicable federal, state, tribal, local laws and regulations and shall be rendered non-retrievable. So this is really also including uh, FDA, or excuse me, EPA regulations for uh, the wasting of, of drugs. Our second point is where multiple controlled substances are commingled, the method of destruction has to be sufficient to render all the controlled substances non-retrievable. So a process um, cannot just um, knowingly um, dis uh, cause destruction to say coating, but not uh, benzodiazepines. So they were clear that it really needs to be a process that could affect all controlled substances. And then the third point here is that the method of destruction shall be consistent with the purpose of rendering all controlled substances to a non-retrievable state. And again, the goal of the DEA is always to prevent diversion, to protect the public and the health and safety. So I uh, bolded for you non-retrievable in all of these statements because it's actually in this act that the DEA coined this phrase. Um, so there was intent there, uh, but not always a clear understanding of what uh, non-retrievable meant. So here we realized and we saw how the ultimate user um, was responsible. Um, we also saw how registrants were engaged under this regulation. And it 
um, showed us that there were um, options under the mailbag programs, the kiosks, and the collection events. But at the same time, there are also healthcare facilities that their operations may not necessarily be clearly covered under these regulations. And so let's go to the next slide and um, see how we can address that. So next slide, please. So when we're talking about healthcare, when we're talking about um, pharmacy in acute care settings, one of the first, oops, can you go back one slide? One of the first questions we ask, there you go, thank you, is, is the controlled substance in the pharmacy's inventory? And uh, if the answer is yes, then pharmacy knows that they either have to send um, through reverse distribution as a transfer between residents, all outdated controlled substances, including partial vials used in compounding, uh, but they cannot use devices, sequestration devices for the disposal of these drugs, okay? So the other option that pharmacies have in acute care settings would be if um, they have a permitted incinerator available to them, then two employees could witness that destruction, um, complete form 41, and everything would be taken care of. Okay, so those are the only options if the pharmacies, um, if the controlled substance is in the pharmacy's inventory. Next slide, please. The next question is, has the controlled substance been charged out to a patient? Meaning it is no longer in the pharmacy's inventory, in the vault, it is no longer in the pharmacy's inventory that would be stocked in um, automated dispensing cabinets. And we'll see this in a bit. If the answer is yes to that, then any drug that remains after the patient is administered that medication, that's actually considered wastage. That technically is outside of the DEA closed, closed loop system. So think about the closed loop system from the manufacturing, preparation, ordering, dispensing, all the way through that destruction but it is being tracked, it is being transferred between the registrants, that is the closed loop. Once it goes to the wastage side, that is outside of DEA's purview, if you will, wastage is more of the, um, it's the responsibility of, of EPA. So the requirement of DEA is to, again, ensure that diversion is prevented, but they also want to ensure that destruction happens. And they have recommendations and regulations on, on what to document. But um, the true management of that wastage is, is not uh, in their purview. Go to the next slide, please. So um, for the controlled substances, they again need to be, you know, recorded, stored, destroyed in, in accordance with the uh, regulations. And part of that documentation process is listed there as the name of the drug, the strength, number of units or volume, the name, address of the patient, name or initials of the person administering it. And again, this is part of that um, ending the cycle of that drug, if you will. So that piece is, is required. Okay, so that's a lot of words describing it. Here, if you could go back one more slide. Here is a, oh, I had one. <laughs> We're almost there. There we go, thank you. Um, here is what it looks like from an operation standpoint. Now, let me draw your attention to the colors. Um, the gold color 
is actually the regulations per DEA. So it is saying that controlled substances in pharmacies inventory on that left-hand side are drugs that you would find in the vault. Um, it would be drugs that are in date or drugs that are uh, out of date, um, remaining drugs that have um, been compounded or repackaged. But what's important to, to notice is that what needs to happen there is that those drugs, again, can only go to that reverse distributor or they could be incinerated on site if indeed there was a permitted incinerator close for this pharmacy. Most places do not have that. So reverse distribution is the way to go. And then because EPA is saying hazardous drugs need to go to hazardous um, waste vendors for incineration, there is actually two paths that those drugs can take, okay? Going across the top of that slide, um, it's taking drugs from that inventory and it is now going to be administered to the patient. So we're now looking at possibilities where that patient, um, that, that, excuse me, that controlled substance could be charged out to the patient. So under that, um, column there, and I want to bring to your attention the fact that it is dispensed for a patient, not to a patient, because there's also a return arrow that says dispose for a patient and it goes right back into inventory, which is allowable in a healthcare setting because it has not been dispensed to the patient. It's still kind of quasi in their inventory because it hasn't been administered yet. Okay, so the options under this column on the right is that uh, the drug is fully administered, so there's nothing to waste, it's charged. Um, the drug was not administered at all, it wasn't charged, and so it's going to that box in the middle. It can go back into the dispensing cabinets on the unit, or it could go back into inventory. Or partial, dose was administered and now we have wastage. So that wastage then, it needs to be accounted for. So under DEA, it's telling us that indeed it needs to have witness documentation. It is also telling us that um, a way that it is held or managed, if you will, is through sequestration devices. Um, the ultimate goal here is going to be incineration, but because EPA is dealing with waste of pharmaceuticals, again, there's the hazardous waste track and the non-hazardous waste track, okay? So note also that the green boxes are specific for um, the management of that waste under RICRA. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. One more slide. Yes, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna bring your attention to this slide. Um, so now we have big X's and the X is saying that the original RICRA regulations are now being replaced by subpart P. And what subpart P does, because I see we're, we're running kind of um, low on time, is that it actually allows for management of controlled substances that are also um, uh, hazardous waste. And so it allows for the exemption of those controlled substances now to be managed as non-hazardous waste. So that's where you see that blue over there. So it doesn't have to go, it can go um, through hazardous waste vendors, but it does not have to go that way. Next slide, please. Okay. So the big thing with the EPA final rule was that the regulations really were not for healthcare. 
that was one problem. The second problem was there was confusion around this intersection between EPA and DEA for uh, controlled substances. And then there was always um, this looming issue because there was there were ways that hazardous uh, waste pharmaceuticals could end up in um, our water systems. Next slide, please. So what happened when subpart P came into being is that effective that day, August 21st of 2019, in all states, all hazardous drugs were banned from being sewered. This allowed um, all uh, controlled substances that were also hazardous drugs to be banned from being sewered. So now, it, because EPA cannot address non-hazardous drugs, um, it can only regulate on hazardous pharmaceutical waste. Um, it could only put this ban in place for that. But in essence, their um, attempt is really to ensure that no drugs are going to be put into uh, the sewer. That's the ultimate goal, but they can only regulate for hazardous. The other thing that this did is that there was this exemption for controlled substances. Next slide, please. And what we'll see is that subpart P isn't everywhere. So it's still, um, it's still being adopted. There are still states struggling with it, but the, um, the sewer and ban for controlled substances is in place everywhere. Next slide, please. Thank you. So operationally, uh, what, did, what did the EPA exemption do? It actually um, allows that the wastage can be dealt with from a DEA perspective, not with controlled substances in inventory, because that still has to go through reverse distribution, but products that um, are charged out to the patient, partially used, administered, things like chloral hydrate, fentanyl, sublingual sprays, testosterone, diazepam injectables, those can be managed um, under EPA as non-hazardous with DEA um, regulations intact. And let's go to the next slide, please. So the other thing that this meant is that the devices no longer need to be disposed into the hazardous. Controlled substances and these devices cannot be disposed in the trash because from a healthcare facility, there are waste disposal regulations specific for that. And it is always advised that controlled substances not be placed into containers like red sharps because again, the, um, the, um, risk of diversion is so much higher. Next slide, please. Here's some examples of those sequestration devices. Next slide. So in summary, on the right-hand side, um, again, let me call out, these drugs cannot be sewered. They need to be managed in compliance with DEA regulations. Destroyed by a method DEA has publicly deemed in writing to be acceptable as non-retrievable, and they need to be combusted at one of five types of incinerators. Next slide, please. So where are we at? So because this, um, because we've had conflict and we have challenges between DEA and EPA, what does non-retrievable mean? Uh, DEA coming out and really saying that the ultimate result is um, non-retrievable, but not really giving us a means of what that means. Um, it's it's led to confusion. And um, so what Congress did is actually invited DEA to have conversations with industry and industry that provides these devices and industry that can offer other options 
to incineration as an alternative. And as I mentioned, um, this was out in the Federal Register at the end of October, and it has now gone through its cycle of uh, receiving uh, results and reviews and recommendations. So next slide, please. So again, what we have here is it's showing in the middle now, you see a, a red box with the arrow. And it's showing that at the point of wastage is really where we have our latest challenge. Um, we need to be able to clearly define and to have EPA and DEA clearly use terminology that doesn't conflict and does define what can happen there. And also on the left-hand side where the big orange box is, there's also challenges there because even as compliant as people want to be in terms of um, the, the disposal of their controlled substances and in inventory, we know that there are still challenges there as well. So from the next slide, please. From our standpoint, from our vantage point in pharmacology, we really would like to see pharmacies be able to, to dispose of their controlled substances that are inventory, not only just having reverse distribution as an option, but also maybe being able to take advantage of sequestration devices. Another point that um, pharmacology is interested in pursuing um, is looking at requiring that the wastage in those devices, that it is, it's clear um, that they need to be incinerated at facilities listed for hazardous waste controlled substances. And so we're not providing an um, alternate for incineration there. We would like that to be encouraged. And then also specifying that uh, or asking DEA to specify what it means for the appropriate destruction to the point of non-retrievable. Last slide, please. So the benefits that we see would be that it would redefine the process and ensure that the regulations are compatible with pharmacies um, in acute care settings and their operations. It would assure that the sequestration devices used that currently are out of regulation are properly managed. And it would remove uncertainty around which sequestration devices render the controlled substances non-retrievable. And it would negate unsubstantiated claims of non-retrievability and directions to dispose in the trash by some manufacturers of sequestration devices. So with that, that concludes my comments for today and I'm happy to accept um, questions in our remaining time. All right, thank you, Kathleen. This has been fantastic. Um, a lot of good information. Um, let me see, I think I saw a couple questions. Um, we're running short on time, but we have two questions in the chat. So the first one is given the expense required to maintain receptacles, is there any consideration being made for the evolution of medication disposal supplies and how they fit into the federal regu regulations around disposal? For example, Dispose RX. Yeah, um, the cost is it can be uh, exorbitant, um, and that's why it's a voluntary uh, process. And there are also um, there's states that are requiring manufacturers to help sustain those programs and help fund that. So again, we can work towards providing those services, not at the expense always of the um, the collectors, if you will, but to have support from the pharmaceutical industry as well. And then the second question is, it's a, so a known spill at a healthcare facility prior to dispensing, for example, Tussianex suspension to incinerator only question mark, um, can't use destroyer RX, et cetera, with DEA form 41. Right, so um, that would be a wastage 
Um, it was, it's out of inventory. <laughs> it's not going to be able to be um, um, collected and be able to be measured unless they know. Um, if so, it could, and it may have to look at your uh, facilities policies. They may decide that that would be wastage or they may decide to put it back into uh, inventory and then record it on 41. I would think that most places would wanna go that way. That Perfect. Awesome. Um, so I think those were all the questions that we have. Um, I know your contact information is up there. Um, so people can email you if they have any questions. Um, once again, we wanna thank you for joining us today. Um, we really enjoyed this. Um, thank you, Kathy, um, as well. This has been an excellent education opportunity for NASCA membership. Um, did you have anything to say, Kathy? No, I just wanted to say I'll be sending out a copy of the recording um, probably in the next couple of days. Okay. So on behalf of NASCA, I would like to thank everyone who joined today's webinar. Um, and thank you again to our sponsors for making today's webinar possible. And we wish you guys a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.